Hey everyone, um, look I've just decided to do a really short video to give you guys a explainer around how we train and teach our clients and supporters about what is the difference between a safe work methodology statement, a standard operating procedure, a JSA, a JSEA, a pre-start, a 5x5, five five, a take 5, the list just goes on and on. And for many of you it becomes incredibly confusing and for others they have made the mistake of piling it all together and putting it into one pot, simply stating that it's one and the same thing. Now from my perspective and from a bar safety's perspective, there are some key differences between all of these different types of documents. We call it the hierarchy of documentation. We present this in our, um, uh, our workplace health and safety management systems that we provide to our clients and we provide this in a lot of our training. So I thought it would be worthwhile just spending a couple of moments to explain to you all how we see this all fitting together. And hopefully this will bring you a lot of value and enable you to start making a bit more sense of all of this. If there's lots of background noise um, happening whilst I'm doing this, my apologies, we've got a bit of a building site going on at the office just next door, and we've also got a whole flock of seagulls hanging around as well. So there are no parrots in the office, but certainly a lot of seagulls outside. So let's kick off, right? So the hierarchy of documentation. At the very start of all of this, at the very top of this pyramid, we have the acts, all right? So the pieces of law that any business within New Zealand or overseas has to abide by. Now that we're coming from a health and safety point of view, it will be obviously the Health and Safety at Work Act 2015. Um, and beneath, well, next to that could be the, um, uh, the um, Employment Relations Act, could be um, the Roads Act, um, and then sitting beneath that are all of the subsequent regulations that sit directly beneath that legislation. So let's just simply put regulations underneath this. Hopefully you can read my handwriting. Okay, so underneath that we've got regulations. Now, um, beneath regulations we can have um, accepted codes of practice, um, so let's just put um, regulations and ACOP, accepted codes of practice. These are practices that have been accepted by the regulator uh, here in New Zealand, it's WorkSafe NZ, um, and also by industry specific um, uh, key partners that have had a stake in those um, guidelines. Now, directly beneath that, we have guidelines, industry specific publications. Uh, manufacturers information and guidelines so they sit snugly beneath here so guidelines perhaps published by WorkSafe uh, guidelines published by industry specific um, uh, market leaders or um, industry specific such as scaffolding um, uh, mobile web, web, uh, web platforms uh, they all produce their own guidelines and their own material to help us make informed decisions. Now directly beneath this area we have workplace health and safety management systems. Now for um, many businesses in New Zealand they're still struggling with this piece of the puzzle but a workplace um, health and safety management system is a safe system of work. It's how we ensure that we are identifying our hazards and risks, that we are adequately controlling those, that we are monitoring the adequacy and efficiency and effectiveness of those controls. And then what are we doing um, based on our findings? How are we acting on that and making continuous improvement? Now, um, underpinning all of that is the company health and safety policy statement. That one pager, that, that business commitment to say that we recognise our legal responsibilities, we're going to do everything in our power to match or exceed industry guidelines and what WorkSafe and Z require of us, and it's all captured within this one pager, which is often signed and dated by a senior member of the officer um, body. So often it's the CEO of the business that will sign off on that. Now this isn't 
just for large high-risk businesses. This really should be done by all businesses in New Zealand of all shapes and sizes. WorkSafe require all businesses to have a safe system of work in place. This is the best place, the best way to do that. Now, next to the health and safety policy is your workplace health and safety management system. Now, this is generally a manual or a means in which the uh, the way in which a business meets its legal responsibility. It has a legal responsibility, for example, to um, report and record workplace injuries and incidents. So within that workplace health and safety management system, there will be a section dedicated to workplace incident reporting, workplace incident investigations, how we um, come up with improvement actions, how we track those improvement actions all the way through to being completed and done, and then how we communicate that back to our staff and to anyone else who has an influence on that particular part of the business. It sounds complicated, but there are some really great tools out there. We make use of the international standard ISO 45001, which pieces all of those parts of the puzzle together really neatly. Combine that with the Health and Safety at Work Act and WorkSafe's regulations and you end up with a really beautiful document that helps pull everything together. If you need help with that, definitely reach out to us. We've, we've helped many, many businesses with that piece of the puzzle. Now directly beneath this, this is where it gets really interesting. So we've got the commitment, we've got the manual that tells us how we do all of this kind of stuff. Now beneath this is where we start to see things such as um, standard operating procedures, um, safe work methodology statements, um, and many, many other acronyms that come with it. Now, these are really critical pieces of documentation. These documents tell us exactly what routine high-risk activities or higher risk activities the business routinely perform. These documents take into account what the Act requires of the business, takes into account the relevant guidelines that will have an effect on the way in which the company does these high risk activities. So if there are guidelines or accepted codes of practice, uh, industry uh, journals, manufacturers guidelines on safe use of scaffolding, or safe use of a piece of equipment or plant in the business, then it would really make sense for the company to take all of this into account and feed that into how the business conducts those high-risk activities. But it doesn't stop there. We have to take into account the input from the men and women that are out there doing that activity all the time. It's no good just simply creating safe work methodology statements um, that define how the business does things. If it's purely being generated by um, two or three individuals at best in the office environment, what do they know about how the activities are actually being performed on the ground? And so the input must come from those people who are involved in the process. So the standard operating procedures, the safe work methodology statements, are really um, documents that don't tend to change very often and when they do change it generally is due to a change in regulation, a change in guidelines, perhaps there's a change in the direction and the mission or purpose of the business or there's been some learnings from the men and women on the ground. Perhaps there's been a safety incident or there's been a tour, tour box talk or a team talk where someone's come up with a new idea which has reduced the risk level of that operation, that ideally feeds back into the business's standard operating procedures or safe work methodology statements, which then filters back through to the way in which the company does it. It's all about continual improvement, and this is a great way to capture that within these types of documents. Now, where it gets a bit messy and a bit confused is when we start then talking about job safety assessments, uh, pre-start assessments, um, five by fives, take fives, um, where the men and women on the ground are uh, routinely, either before a new job kicks off or before they're about to attempt a, a high, high risk, high hazard um, activity, they are asked to pause and reflect. 
Now, what is a really neat way in which to make that piece of the puzzle really simple for them is if they have a stake in input and the safe work methodology statements at this stage, then they can simply refer to this document when they are about to tackle a high risk activity. It means that they're not having to reinvent the wheel every single time they start a new job. So they look at their standard uh, work, um, safe working uh, methodology statements or their standard operating procedures and consider the hazards and risks that they're actually looking at on the day. So um, they may have a checklist, um, a five by five or a take five or a pre-start assessment, which asks them to identify the types of um, risks that they are looking at at that particular time. Then they can then compare that with the company safe work methodology statement. This really is set in stone. They really shouldn't be stepping outside the bounds of these documents. This tells them exactly, step by step, how to do that task safely. If during the pre-start assessment, or during their five by fives, or their take fives, or whatever it is they do, uh, maybe even a, uh, a toolbox, so. When they are considering a high-risk activity, they should always be considering what the company would normally expect them to do. The more input they have on these documentation, the more likely it is they're going to have buy-in and will refer to these documents. Okay, it's really key. Now, during this process, if they find that there are some new hazards, some new risks, some new pieces of equipment, the environmental conditions have changed, the weather is turning a bit south, then they may then want to stick a, or, or pick up a copy of a blank job safety assessment form or a job safety environmental assessment form, JSA, JSEA, um, hazard identification form, whatever, whatever acronyms or whatever uh, tools that your business uses, at this point is when they want to pick up that JSA. So I always get a bit frustrated, and I know a lot of our clients do, when they are asked during the tender stage for a new project or a new job, they're asked to provide a JSEA. Um, they often are asking me why would they want that, because at the moment it's a blank document, we don't even know if we're going to need one until we're actually there on the job. So what we um, suggest our clients do is simply provide their standard operating procedure for that activity, or this safe work methodology statement that's relevant to the type of work that the guys are likely to be performing when they are on that job months down the road. The JSA is an active document that is used to um, uh, review the differences that the guys and girls have identified on the site. So it allows them to break the task down into the particular steps where things are a little bit different to what they normally would do it allows them to identify the risk levels, the controls that they um, can implement on the job at that point in time, and then they can then consider the residual risks. Once they've considered those residual risks, if it meets a particular threshold where they are not allowed to continue work and have to go back to head office to say, hey look, we're still at a residual risk level of high, what do you want us to do? Um, or if the residual risk um, levels are at a low level, then they will most likely be able to continue work. The main and the key piece here is that it's documented and that it is returned back to head office so that those people at head office, if they exist, who are responsible for the management and upkeep of the SOPs and the SWIMs can take the learnings from the JSAs that have been completed out on the site so that this information can then feed back into the company's standard operating procedures and their safe work methodology statements. It's continuously learning, continual improvement of what the business would normally do. By doing this and following this hierarchy of control, the business is continuously improving. It's ensuring that the, the way in which the business is conducting its operations is consistent with how it is in writing and how the business leaders believe the business is being um, operated and it's consistent with the way in which the team are actually doing it in the first place. If we start to get this bottom up and this top down process being captured at this SOP SWMS stage, we're in a really good place when it comes to saving time, 
increasing efficiency and ensuring that we are capturing all of the golden nuggets of information from our team on the ground, but also when there is a regulatory or a guideline change, that we're capturing it in the way in which we are conducting the business. Now, this ultimately brings me back to the point where I get frustrated and I know my clients get frustrated when they are being told that a JSA or a pre-start or a 5x5 toolbox tool to talk um, form is no different to an SOP or an SWMS that swims. As, in my opinion, that's nonsense. There is a high, clear hierarchy of documentation going on here where the SOPs and the swims shouldn't really be changing very frequently or very much. This stuff up here doesn't change um, uh, particularly frequently. Obviously, we're going through quite a bit of change at the moment, but that will, that will settle down. These documents are really the key stone to the way in which the business does its operations. This is key to the way in which the guys and girls perform their work. The documentation below that is there to capture the stuff that's different on site at the time. So hopefully that's got some way to clearing it all up for you. Um, I'll also stick at the end of this video a quick graph, a quick image to explain it. And then I'll leave the contact details for advanced safety and also my direct line if you'd like to reach out uh, to discuss this further or to see how this may improve the efficiencies and capturing communications and getting engagement from your people on the ground um, in the future. Thanks.